Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I would like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Good morning, friends. Brother Ricky and Miss Sonia here. I've been working with Sonia lately uh, for what we're doing this holiday season, and I think we've got a really great idea about how to get you involved. You want to tell them a little bit about it? I do. I am super excited about it. Friends, we are going to go Christmas caroling, and we want to give you the opportunity to join in. You know, with all the distance that we have been experiencing this year, we have found a way to make some very good visits, bringing and spreading some Christmas cheer. And so we're going to get together some groups, mainly families who have ultimately been together for a long time, you know, keeping everybody in the same, in the same group that you've been with. Um, but we're going to send you out, Caroline, visiting some of our dearly, dearly loved ones who haven't had a chance to be with us at all in months. And I know they would love a visit from us. So, what do they need to do? Well, really, just call into the church and let us know that you want to be involved and that you want to sing and carol. And remember, it's caroling, so if you can't sing, you can still do it. You can still be a part of it. So we really want you to get involved, and we hope that you will. We're excited about it, and we hope to hear from you. And all the little children, you call them blessed and too. Love and joy unto you and your Merry Christmas. This morning we are moving into the beautiful heart of Christmas. No matter what we go through personally or collectively, Christmas is a reminder that God is still with us, amen, and that he is the author of the incredible. It may look very discouraging at times. I'm often drawn to the parts of the Christmas story that we don't celebrate, the mothers who lost their children so that that child could live. Even the prophet was quoted, the mothers of Ramah weeping for their children, you know, you think about all that happened in that time of celebration and yet in that great prophetic word that this, this one is set for the rise of many in Israel, the word also was, and the fall of many others, and a sword shall pierce your own soul. You know, there, there are those, that's the reality with God. God is great, but life is often not great. God is marvelous and miraculous, but we don't always get to experience that part, but he's always with us. Amen. Well, I've been telling you about this RIP medical debt because I think it's really an amazing thing, but I want you to hear about it in the words of the founders, and then if you would like to give towards this, you can do that today or any day this week. You can do it online. In your online giving, just put RIP. You can pull, if you're doing it online, you just pull the drop-down menu on the app, the church app on your phone, and in that drop-down menu, you can, there's other when you're giving, and just put RIP, and we'll make sure that it goes, or you can put medical debt, and we'll make sure that it goes to this. We're partnering together with the church in um, uh, Annapolis. I told you last week the name of the church, and I forgot to get it in my uh, mind. It's Ev uh, Elevation Church, or Revolution Church. Anyways... <laughs> Pastor, uh, Pastor, there has been very encouraging, and he's. This is his second one, and our first partnership, and we're excited to be doing it. This is um, R.I.P. Medical Debt. Half of all debt is medical. There's a trillion dollars of debt that is unpayable and won't be paid, but it'll continue to be collected on until I abolish it. This is Craig and Tico. 
In 2014, he founded RIP Medical Debt with his co-founder, Jerry Ashton. We're a charity that buys medical debt and we abolish it. It doesn't make sense for America to have people burdened with $1 trillion worth of medical debt. You and I are one accident or one illness away from being destroyed financially. Before Jerry and Craig were debt abolishers, they were debt collectors, a job they didn't necessarily enjoy. I never liked the debt collection business. I was in a family business. I ended up starting to make money early, and then it was so hard to not make money anymore, so I stayed in it. As a bill collector, collecting millions of dollars in medical associated bills in my career, now all of a sudden, I'm reformed. I am a predatory giver. We can thank Occupy Wall Street uh, for that. Okay, let's back up a bit. Occupy was a global progressive protest movement centered around social and economic inequality. The first Occupy protest was Occupy Wall Street. It started in New York City in Zuccotti Park, right outside of Jerry's office. I said, that looks interesting. I come from the 60s, so I wanted to see if this was real. And I decided I wanted to search for the heroes. I wanted to find the people that were there that were going to make a difference. And I found a lot of them. Then Occupy people noticed that there was a bill collector in their midst. So one day I was asked to attend a meeting of Occupy Wall Street, and they said that they had an idea they wanted to run past me. That idea was the Rolling Jubilee, a crowdfunded effort to raise $50,000 to purchase $1 million of defaulted debt and abolish it. Occupy wanted to know if Jerry thought their plan was a good idea. I didn't think much of it. A million dollars worth of medical debt in my world isn't even a rounding error. I think it'll probably be seen as a gesture. They said, well, let's take a look at it through our eyes. If your medical debt were in that portfolio and forgiven, do you think that you would have considered it to be a gesture? And I said, what do you need? What Occupy needed was expertise. They needed people who understood the debt collection industry. So Jerry called Craig, and together the pair worked with Occupy to make the idea of the Rolling Jubilee a reality. Instead of raising $50,000, Occupy was able to raise $700,000. That enabled Jerry and Craig to abolish over $40 million in medical, student, and payday loan debt. But then something unexpected happened. So one day they came up to us and they said, well, we're gonna close it down. We're going in another direction. And Craig and I looked at each other and we said, we can't let that happen. We were kind of hooked. We said, we're gonna to have to do it ourselves. We'll probably be able to raise two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year like these Occupy Wall Street people did. It wasn't true. <laughs> it's the hardest thing we ever did. Eventually, Jerry and Craig were able to figure out how to raise enough money to start buying and abolishing medical debt. Due in large part to this guy. It is pretty clear by now, debt buying is a grimy business and badly needs more oversight. Because as it stands, any idiot can get into it. And I can prove that to you because I'm an idiot and we started a debt buying company. Which he used to abolish almost $15 million worth of debt through RIP. When John Oliver brought us to everybody's attention, what became a serious attempt to make a difference became an amazing movement. We've helped over 250,000 people get out of over $600 million of medical debt. So it took us a while to ramp up, but now we're gonna reach a billion dollars this year. So watch out. A couple of very, very creative guys, huh? Uh, how about that? He uh, made the statement that in his former world, a million dollars of medical debt was a rounding error. And he said, I'm reformed now. <laughs> so when you look at that whole Occupy Wall Street thing, something did come out of it. You know, they, they went a different direction, but these two guys said, wait a minute, this, um, there's some value here. Now, long term, that was made a couple of years ago. Long term, there, if you go on the website, nearly $3 billion of medical debt has been eliminated 
by these two guys. What they have found is their long-term partnership is guess where? You know where they found folks that would join them and stay with them? Yeah, in the church. Uh huh. Everybody else, they'll do their online or their television fundraiser, and then they're done and ready to go back making money and go on with their life. Nothing wrong with making money, but Jesus calls us to commit and to be a servant for life. Amen? And it's just encouraging to see that the church has, in, in state after state after state, there are church cooperatives. In other words, many churches joining together to make this a reality. You can check out more on ripmedicaldebt.org, but you can also give right here through Central. And uh, towards the end of this week, we'll bring all that giving together, and we'll get it to the church in Annapolis, and we'll give you the total during the Christmas season. All right? Go in your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 40. What I'm going to share with you today, I believe with all my heart, but I feel absolutely none of it. I've been with the Lord long enough and led people in being with the Lord to know that those two things are not necessarily mutually exclusive. It doesn't, know, doesn't matter today how I feel. It matters to me, but it doesn't matter to my walk with God. It doesn't matter to my success in life. It doesn't matter to those that I interact with and serve in ministry. What does matter is what I believe and how I hold to what I believe and what the results are of what I believe. Amen? And so I'm going to share with you today something that I believe with all of my heart. Obviously, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is his word, so I believe it. But I don't feel it. It's been a tough season for all of us, and it's just getting tougher. The staff will tell you that four or five, six weeks ago, I told them the Lord had put one word on my heart and spirit for several days, and that was the word funeral. And I knew right then, I, I just know when that happens, that God is not going to change the course or direction of things, but he's making sure that I'm ready. I've been through times before where... The, it can become overwhelming when, when even the funeral home folks are asking you as the pastor, how are you feeling? Are you doing okay? Is everything stable? Are you overwhelmed? Well, yeah, I'm overwhelmed, but the Lord will help us. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, I want to pick up two verses here. Verse 1 and 2. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. I'm going to read that again just for me, okay? Comfort, comfort my people says your God. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone. Oh, hallelujah. And her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Isaiah is talking uh, prophetically through all of this. You know that. That's why we call him a prophet. He spoke prophetically. One of the major prophets in the Old Testament, meaning his book is very extensive. He covers the rise or the, the prophetic import of Israel's prominence and Jerusalem's place. He then prophesies, of course, the fall, the destruction, the occupation, the terror that will come. And before any of that has happened, he's also prophesying the restoration. Praise God. That's the kind of God we serve. That before anything happens, he tells us, listen, there are some tough times coming. I'm going to be with you through them. At the end of those tough times, I'm going to bless you again. And not that I haven't been blessing you, but it's going to be in a way that you sense it and discern it as positive. With God, everything is positive. He is God. With God, everything is encouraging and uplifting, even the things that we would deem as negative or oppressive. Because for him, in the lives of his people, all things continue, continue to work together for our good, in spite of how bad they can be. But God understands how we perceive things because we're on kind of, I guess you and I would say, the receiving end. We have to deal with the physicality of it, the reality of our world around us. And so here, all only halfway or a little over halfway into the prophetic nature speaking of Isaiah and the drop down, the downloading of all of this that's coming to Jerusalem. Here's what God says, comfort my people. 
But I love in verse 2 this phrase, tell her that her sad days are gone. Today I'm going to encourage myself by saying goodbye to our sad days. Amen. Saying goodbye. Now he's doing it prophetic, okay? So that means it doesn't happen when you walk out of the building necessarily. So we're preaching and believing and listening and engaging God's word today by faith. And we're saying in spite of how we feel. We uh, are so blessed here at Central. We have uh, an atmosphere among those who are on our board, who have been on the board before, on it currently. It's just very relational. And uh, all of us, I think, have worked pretty hard to make that, and I'm comparing it to where we were 20 years ago. And the whole DNA uh, of our church, as well as our board, has changed. And, and so it's much more a relationship-based Reality, And um, I can tell you this week, this past week, there were more emojis. We have a group text. And there were more emojis than I've seen, I think, ever in those group texts. And they were all uh, tears. And uh, it was just very difficult, you know. Brother Gary was a respiratory therapist at the hospital for years and years and years. If anybody would know how to prepare themselves for this particular kind of a virus, it would be him. But this thing is um, almost beyond description. Many things seem more important in this life, yet forgiveness of sins remains preeminent in importance. God speaks through Isaiah of the destruction of all of Israel and Jerusalem as well, even though the temple was there. But when he begins to talk about restoration, when he begins to talk about not just joy, but happiness returning, it's always connected to forgiveness. It's not connected to money. It's not connected to alcohol. It's not connected to family and celebration. It's always connected to forgiveness. Because what God did in forgiving us is beyond all the description of all the words in the English language. And if we knew every other language, all of the words that we could bring to bear on trying to describe it, it defies description. You and I and all of eternity will not fully understand what God did in forgiving us, what it was to forgive, what it cost to forgive, what it produced to forgive. Hallelujah. Because in forgiveness, the church was brought forth, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, i got to be careful because I could go right to the story of Isaac sending, or excuse me, Abraham sending the servant to get a bride for Isaac because I love that story. Nevertheless, you and I have to be reminded constantly of the fact that nothing is more important than our forgiveness. From the moment we are forgiven, comfort flows. Comfort begins to flow. And we can, we've experienced it, and we can take it for granted. I'm not mocking us or in any way criticizing or, or trying to rebuke us for it. It's just human nature. But it's also the nature of God's people. The, the comfort, the forgiveness is so all-encompassing and the comfort so constant that it's easy for us to then say, okay, God, and now would you do this? And now, and Jesus even encourages us in that. Whatever you need, ask. Whatever you need, seek. Whatever you need, knock. He said that, right? But for God, it's a reminder that comfort is ever-present. We still face sad days here, but that will change. Go to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. And that's one of the reasons I focus so much on the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ that's coming here, what we call the millennial government, but his kingdom on earth, because the ultimate fulfillment of God's comfort and the end of sad days is here on earth, and it's the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ, but we're not going there today. Look at verse 13. Sing for joy, O heavens, rejoice, O earth, burst into song, O mountains, For the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on them in their suffering. Number one today, compassion comes from the Lord's comfort. Compassion. 
This is one of our great needs in life. It's one of the things we cry for, literally, oftentimes. It's a thing that we need and demand, sometimes without words. You can see this often in the lives of kids. They don't even understand the full emotion. I'm not sure that I do at 55, but we can go through things, and our desperate need is for compassion, for somebody to fully understand what we're feeling and experiencing and trying to deal with and and unpack in our lives, and, and we just can't, and we're overwhelmed. But when God comes alongside, when the Holy Spirit is working in our life, out of God's comfort comes compassion. We read it again and again in the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have compassion on these people. Because when God is comforting us, he doesn't just say, there, I hope you feel better, see you after a while. But he hangs around, he stays in the battle with us, and he says to you and I, I understand what you're feeling. I don't know how drugs, and I'm talking about illegal narcotics, I don't understand how gambling, I don't understand how alcohol are able to convince people that they have the ability to make us fully understood, that they have the ability to make us fully restored, understood, heard, felt. But God does. And he says to you and I, he says to his people, and I know I'm going through and just picking out verses, but we're going to stay in Isaiah. There are two great passage, two authors who touch on on comfort more than any other, and that's Isaiah and Paul in 2 Corinthians. He uses the word for the Greek word that we translate as comfort multiple times in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And these are the places throughout Isaiah, and then in 2 Corinthians 1, we find comfort more there than anywhere else. And I think Paul gets it from Isaiah. He sees it. Ultimately, we can only receive it from God who loves us. Remember the promise. You tell the people of God, say goodbye to your sad days. Don't you just love that? That would make a great title for a book. Saying goodbye to my sad days. (laughs) And you can write that today, and and you know that you're going to have another sad day in life. Right? But we do it by faith. Now, compassion here, if you have the New Living Study Bible, it, the word compassion is not only uh, footnoted at the bottom of your page, but it's part of the um, study series, the study guide in your Bible. And if you look it up, it has it right there in the center column. It's from the Hebrew word rakam, R A K H A M. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, but rakam, they, and they say that really hard H usually in Hebrew that I don't like saying, but so I won't. Here's here's what it means in your New Living Study System. The word has a special focus on mercy or pity toward a person in difficult circumstances. The word for compassion here, the word that we take as compassion, has a special focus on mercy or pity toward a person in difficult circumstances circumstances. <laughs> and I told you when I started, I don't necessarily feel this today, but I believe it. And I know that if I stay in alignment with God, I don't have to convince him that I feel a certain way even when I don't. He knows my heart. I don't have to try to convince myself that's deception and it's only going to lead to resentment inside. It's going to cause my health to fail. I can be honest with God. I can be true and transparent. He knows me exactly how I am. He knows me better than I do. But even though I don't feel it today, I also know him. I don't know him better than he does. I don't know him to the depths that he knows me, but I know him. And I know that if I stay with him, following, sometimes close by, other times stumbling over my own sorrow, trying to keep up like a child with a father, I know that 
if I'm there in the shadow of his wings, there will come a day. It might be tomorrow. It might be in two or three days, but there will be breakthrough and I will feel his comfort and his compassion will flow to me out of that. Not just for me as a sinner, but me in my situation, in the heartache that I'm going through, in the brokenness that I feel for those of you who are the family of those that we've lost, for the compassion of God to flow to you means that he understands the grieving process and he's with you in it and he will not forsake you as you go through it on the days that you're angry and hurt on the days you're disappointed and overwhelmed when you pick up the phone and realize you'll never hear their voice again he's still with you and his compassion flows to you in that brokenness he doesn't say oh I'm sorry I'm up here and you're down there he doesn't say well I don't understand what you're I'm, I'm a God shut up and just worship he doesn't do any of that I think amazing that this is the same Isaiah that has that great teaching on idols. People of Israel had struggled with idolatry so much throughout their history. And Isaiah has several passages where he says, he's speaking for God. I have no idea why you can take a log, use half of it to make a fire, carve the other half into some ridiculous man-made object and then call it a God. In other places, he talks about the ones fashioned out of silver, and, and yet they did it. God says, I'm not like that. I'm not just here when you walk by. I'm always here. And out of my comforting you, my compassion also flows. I have pity on you in what you're going through. Because I know the hurt of losing a loved one. Here's the second thing. Go to Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah 51 and 12. Yes, I, yes, I am the one who comforts you. So why are you afraid of mere humans who wither like the grass and disappear Yet you have forgotten the Lord, your creator, the one who stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. Will you remain in constant dread of human oppressors? Will you continue to fear the anger of your enemies? Where is their fury and anger now? It is gone. Soon all you captives will be released. Imprisonment, starvation, and death will not be your fate. For I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea, causing its waves to roar. My name is the Lord of heaven's armies. Hallelujah. I'm going to back up and do that again. For I am the Lord your God who stirs up the sea, causing its waves to roar. My name is the Lord of heaven's armies. And I have put my words in your mouth and hidden you safely in my hand. I stretched out the sky. This is a repeat of what he's already said. I stretched out the sky like a canopy and laid the foundations of the earth. I am the one who says to Israel, you are my people. Hallelujah. Number two today, fear can keep us from seeing his comfort. He starts that passage again, prophetically, God speaking. Comfort is what I declare for my people. And why are you still so focused on human oppressors? And he says, I'm, I'm the God that stretched out the canopy of the sky. I don't know if you were out this morning, but there's a star or a, an alignment of something, a planet and a star or two planets or something, and they call it the Christmas star. Uh, not that that's what guided the wise men to, to Bethlehem, but nevertheless... So it was, it was from here in the church, in the sanctuary, it was almost straight out. It was in the uh, eastern or southeastern sky this morning and uh, bright, oh, super bright. And then the moon was coming up, the tiniest sliver of moon that you ever see. And as I looped the church the first time this morning, it was about three quarters of the way up over the little mountain straight out the valley there. And so you had the... Cri- The Christmas star right here and the moon at just the moment of the break of gray in the sky, it was fiery red and it looked like a flame coming up out of that mountain. It only lasted for about five minutes. When I came back around, it was already up higher than that. But 
to see what was going to be the sunrise. It wasn't up yet, but there was light over there. And just to see that and to know that this is what I was going to read in just one tiny slice of our sky was phenomenal. And I said to the Lord, you, you paint for us every day. That sky tells the wonders of God every single day. And it never repeats itself. Number one, compassion comes from the Lord's comfort. Number two, fear can keep us from seeing his comfort. Everything in this world has the potential to cause us fear. But their fury and anger will disappear. The thing that you trusted for years can suddenly turn fearful. You can trust your health or your strength for years, but something can happen, a catastrophic accident, and suddenly the thing that you trusted, your strength, your health, suddenly that thing now becomes fearful because now you're going to be treated by others. You're going to be in the control of others and not your own control. And that can be so fear-inducing that it can cause you to be shaken even in your spiritual foundations. And so God is speaking through Isaiah and he says to his people, whoa, time out. Don't forget who I am. I put a canopy over you every night. And that isn't just a canopy of darkness. It's a canopy of the glory of the heavens. And every day I encamp round about you and so I say to you you are my people and you never will not be my people this was Israel in the midst of their backsliding in the midst of their rejection of so much of what God asked them to carry in their lives this was Israel Israel like the church is never the picture the picture is always the son of God who never quits loving us, never quits sacrificing, never quits praying. This is the picture of him. And then he says, listen, there are a lot of things in life you can fear. I understand that. But don't. Don't fear your human oppressors. Don't fear the bill collectors because God can reform them. Amen? <laughs> I, I like that. And what they say that we're now serial givers or something. They had a phrase for that they now, that's all they do is serial generosity. I just thought that was so cool, you know. And the, the one guy testified, if I can use that word, to having, you know, inherited this family business or be brought into this family business, started making money and could never see a way to quit making money. And then they went down, they didn't start those protests, but they went down and the other gentleman said, I wanted to see if there were any there, I'm going to paraphrase, who were really genuine, who really wanted to make a difference. I thought, how insightful. He knows that in most protests, the majority of the people are just, they're just on a, a parade march, you know. They just don't want to be at work that day or they're hoping there's a free sandwich along the line. But there are those who are there. And these guys went down to see who they could find. And out of that came basically nobody. And so the two of them said, we can do this. I thought it was also interesting that guys who have moved tens or maybe hundreds of millions of dollars or more around offices on Wall Street, that these guys said, we can make a difference. In the first year, they tried to raise $500,000 and couldn't do it. And said, this is the hardest thing we've ever done. <laughs> yeah, welcome to my world, huh? <laughs> See, you can get money out of people when you're giving them something, a product or a service. But when you're just saying, listen, it's more blessed to give than to receive, hey, hey welcome to the party, huh? It takes faith. It takes a work of God. And it was just encouraging to see these guys older in life, very experienced to start a new journey. And that's part of why I uh, like what they're doing because you see in them a desire to really make a difference, and they no longer they no longer look through the lens they used to. And so even when you fear a bill collector, they're just one day, one moment away from a total transformation. Now here's the ultimate enemy, and that's death. And so God has to help us to understand that even in death, 
he is still to be honored and celebrated, and death is not to be feared. Go to chapter 61 now, Isaiah 61. And let's read verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. You should recognize this text very well. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted and to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. In the King James, the word there is to heal the brokenhearted. Verse 61 in the middle. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted. Uh, I don't think the... Is it the King James that uses heal? Or is it the, the Hebrew? Uh, the King, come on, help me with the King James there. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Yeah, and the Hebrew is heal. I'm sorry. Heal. But the New Living uses the word comfort. Verse 2. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. Number three today, in his comfort there is healing. And the ultimate healing is that he will deal with our enemies. The ultimate healing, you and I cannot experience a permanent lasting healing until all of our enemies are dealt with. And this prophecy, as you and I know, is picked up by Jesus. And he says, he reads it, he reads it in a way that nobody's ever read it before. He closes the book, the scroll, he rolls up the scroll. Don't you love that? Hallelujah. He just rolls up the scroll and uh, says, and if you go to Israel now, you'll still see them. You can see it here in the U.S. when you are watching a young man go through bar mitzvah who'll have a scroll of a portion of the Old Testament or the Torah and he'll have that scroll and he'll be carrying it as they celebrate his becoming a man at 13. And in, in Jerusalem they do it all the time and they're carrying it and Jesus rolled up a scroll like that and closed it and said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your midst. <laughs> you know, American churchgoers, we'd be like, oh, okay, what's next? What's for lunch? Are we going to Burger King today or what's happening? But in the Jewish culture, in the synagogue, when you said that, you just sent shockwaves through the entire nation before he got back to the home he was staying at. I guarantee you the high priest in Jerusalem had heard what had happened there. Well, pastor, they didn't have internet. They didn't even have phones. I guarantee you there was somebody running from town to town, village to village, and that word was spreading at the speed of light. There is one in Galilee who has declared he's the Messiah. He has read from the messianic prophecy that the Lord would come and that he would heal us and comfort us and be with us and bind us and restore us. The Lord has come to the house. And I can tell you from that moment they were determined that it wasn't him and he wasn't fit to live. He quoted verse 1. Today I've quoted for you verse 2 as well. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor has come and with it the day of God's anger against their enemies. Hallelujah. And Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Healing for the brokenhearted is the message of the gospel. God's anger will eventually prevail against all of our enemies. His anger will prevail against every enemy. The enemy of oppression, the enemy of poverty, the enemy of sickness, the enemy of disease and virus, the enemy of our souls, Satan, and the enemy of death. You and I have to go through it right now. And we often say, and I tend to agree, that when we lose a loved one, it would be easier if it was us yeah to us but in losing that person we feel like we've lost part of ourselves the Gary and Sister Carol were married 49 years I talked to her on the phone several times through this journey and process some of you did as well and um, those were not easy conversations there's nothing that any of us can say that can change it, restore it, 
make it better, make it up, transform it. But there is something in God's word, and while we don't yet fully possess it, we've got a down payment on it. While we don't own all of the contents of the promise, we don't yet have the full inheritance. We have been given the Holy Spirit, and God said, listen, I'm going to give you a down payment so that you understand I'll make payments on the entire investment, the loan. I'll make payments all the way through your life, but I'm not going to pay that thing off until you join me here in glory. I'm not going to fully bank on this until you're with me. But all along the way, you will feel payments at times. I've given you the Holy Spirit as a down payment. And when you're in your prayer closet and there's a breaking forth of worship and praise, when you're in the sanctuary and you feel the anointing, when you're at the altar and the river of life is flowing, those are the payments that I'm making. And if you think that's good, you haven't felt anything yet. You wait till you walk through the gates. You wait till you come down the highway. You wait until you see my throne and approach the son of the living God because in that day, your enemies will be destroyed. In that day, you will have nothing to fear. In that day, I will fulfill every promise I've ever made to you. Not one of them will fail. Not one. Not one. I wish he would fulfill them all in this life. But he will not. He has not promised to, and he will not. As a matter of fact, he's promised not to. We go through difficult things. The king who wrote, yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. He was the king that laid there in front of his dying child day after day, fasting, weeping and worshiping. And when they said the child is gone, he got up and said, he will not come back to me, but I will go to him. Because David knew that what we get here is just a down payment and a few payments along the way. But the balance, the balance will not be paid in full until the church comes home. Isaiah said, I'm supposed to tell God's people, fear not. Don't fear anything, for I'm with you. We read in Psalms this week, this past couple of weeks, the 23rd, the 119th, the 51st, David, in his brokenness, cries out, Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. He knew the power of that down payment. And I would say to you today, be comforted. You may not believe it fully, but don't let go of your belief in it. Part of our belief is always connected to our feelings in our human state, our humanity. It just is. But maintain that belief that prevails over your feelings. Maintain that belief. You've been touched by God before. You've felt his presence before. You've experienced his closeness one other time, ten other times. You will again. You will someday again. But in the midst of your feelings, God will comfort. He'll come into the situation in the days and weeks that transpire. And he will comfort Sometimes it will come through something you read or you hear. Other times, just a still moment with him. Sometimes it will be watching, observing his creation. Other times it will be hearing a forgotten song. I was reading one of the psalms the other day, and I was thinking, we used to sing that in the 80s. I haven't heard it since. I don't remember what it was now, but... I was just reminded of how God gives his church songs that minister to us. But there's a day coming when we will hear a song we've never heard in the presence of God. Amen. Bow your hearts with me this morning, please. Father, thank you so very much for your promise to comfort us. Lord, I pray for your people today, including myself. Lord, I pray that we would be comforted, 
that we would be comforted. Hmm. May we hear what Isaiah said, comfort, comfort my people. Jesus, help us. Church, while you're praying for just a moment, I want to talk to folks who may be watching us now online. Before you go, I want to give you the opportunity to experience the comfort of God. Saying yes to the Lord never means going through life without any emotions or feelings. It doesn't mean going through life without setbacks, difficulties, problems, and even death. As a matter of fact, we know all of those things are still very prevalent in this broken world. But what it does mean is that God speaks in the midst of what we're going through. He tries to remind us that our greatest challenge is not really the situation. It's our own sin. Because from his view, from his vantage point, the greatest work that's ever taken place in all of creation was not the forming of the stars, the sun and the moon, not the bringing forth of the birds and the reptiles and animals. The greatest work in all of God's cosmos was redeeming fallen man. From the very first one, man chose to fall away. But from that very first man, God chose to work to bring redemption, to buy us back. And while we look at things going on all around us and sometimes the things happening to us and we say, where is God in my brokenness? God's saying, I'm right here. Where are you in your brokenness? Because on our journey, it's very difficult for us to assess where we are. It can be so overwhelming. Some of my people here at church have lost multiple loved ones in the last few months, multiple close, immediate family members. And that compounds the feeling of despair. And in the midst of all of that, you can get lost in your own feelings of abandonment and emotional distress. But God says, I'm the... I'm the rock in the midst of all of this. Stay with me even when you don't know how to feel, even when you're overwhelmed by your emotions. Stay with me and my comfort will come. Do you know that kind of comfort? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ, the great comforter? And if you don't, it's time to get in. Before the door closes, you know how to open your heart up. You know how to confess. You're right there in your home or at your place of employment. You might even be in your vehicle pulled over somewhere. Tears, tears. Through those tears, watching this video, I want to tell you today that Jesus is the comforter that comes to you and I and makes it possible for us to know God and to know life. Tell him today. Tell him that you want him and that you'll do anything to have him. And he'll tell you he's already done it. All you have to do is surrender. Father, we thank you today for the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the power to heal us and restore us, to help us and change us. Bless your people today, Lord. Bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Would you stand with me this morning, church, all over this place? And those of you who have joined us by live stream, thank you so much. You know what we've been doing these last couple of months to um, stay distanced and all of that is to go into this altar time with flexibility. But I, I pray, I beg you today, make an altar there at your seat. If you don't step out of where you are and come forward, that's fine, absolutely perfect. If you'd like to come forward, absolutely. St uh, stay to the right or the left, wherever, and let the Lord speak to you. But wherever you are, make an altar. Make an order that says, God, I need your comfort. If you understand what the medical community is saying, we're not going to see happier days for a little while longer. But there's a day coming when God says, you can say goodbye <laughs> to your unhappy days. <laughs> Amen. And we look forward to that day. Brother Ricky's going to lead us in a song this morning. During this time, worship as we commit ourselves fresh and new to the Lord. Let's, let's dig into his purposes. Amen. I love you today. I love you in the Lord. And uh, thank you for praying for Sister Pam and I and the, and the team. 
We appreciate your prayers daily. God bless you. Brother Ricky.